Thank you, Julian. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, thank you, Shane, for the very interesting talk. And I think that my talk is sort of almost an ideal follow up to your talk. Um, uh, and I will get into that a little bit during the talk. But um, I will give a talk uh, that has two parts. Uh, one is um, uh, sort of introducing myself and, and also the uh, some of the major consequences uh, that came out of actually having developed Ceph here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I should say that Sage Weil was really driving that effort, who was a former graduate student um, here at UC Santa Cruz. And I was uh, one of the key mentors uh, doing that project. Uh, he was a student of Scott Brandt. And um, he basically you know, took it upon himself to build a new storage system. Um, but then the second part, uh, after I talk about so these consequences, including the founding and, uh, and, and running the Center for Research in Open Source Software, um, I'm going to talk about um, Ceph itself and uh, some of the new developments um, that came, uh, that, that, you know, that uh, are happening and, um, and that I'm excited about. And so it's sort of like the, um, uh, a combination of, of sort of more of an organizational talk and a technical talk. So, and I'm sorry I misspelled uh, the BCS Open Source Specialist Group. It's definitely supposed to say it's open source, not open source. <laughs> so, um, okay, a little bit uh, about me. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor, step four, which is a little unusual for an adjunct professor, but I'm basically way past um, uh, a tenure. Um, uh, I've been doing this for uh, yeah 15 years, um, pretty much all of my time. So I'm not doing anything else. Um, I graduated nine PhD students and nine master's students. Um, currently advising five PhD students. Um, before I came to UC Santa Cruz, uh, I worked at as performance engineer at NetApp. And I'm the founder and director of the Center for Research and Open Source Software, and then also the co-founder and director of the UCSC Systems Research Lab together with Scott Brandt. Um, so my current research focuses mostly on programmable storage systems. Um, it's essentially the idea of teaching new tricks to, uh, to existing storage systems architectures. Um, then also the, uh, you know, the um, pretty active in the general field of big data storage and processing, scalable data management, uh, as well as distributed systems performance management. So performance management, uh, including some real-time systems, but uh, focusing on distributed systems. And then more recently, um, uh, also in practical falsifiable research, which is basically practical reproducibility. And I really stress the word practical um, uh, because I think that uh, there are some incredible opportunities, uh, you know, due to these new technologies that Shane already talked about, uh, like containers, um, that I sort of summarize as software delivery methods that uh, science can adopt to also uh, improve the delivery of science. So um, I... Uh, I'm very, very glad to have uh, uh, a lot of NSF funding. I uh, recently also completed a DOE grant. Um, and I have also funding from the Center for Research and Open Source Software. In fact, there are like two incubator projects and two research projects, and I will talk a little bit about that. But I want to highlight the, the, the top one, which is uh, uh, I'm a part of the Institute for Research and Innovation and Software for High Energy Physics. And this is a grant that started two years ago um, and it's a five-year grant and it's basically just finished the, uh, um, so the, the, these institutes have basically two phases. There's a design phase and there's a, uh, a execution phase and we just entered the execution phase and um, uh, they, uh, they, I'm happy to tell you that they're just decided to embrace really uh, object storage, Ceph, and the extension of Ceph that we were proposing uh, to them. And I'm also going to talk towards the end of the talk a little bit about that. But this is sort of a, a very big deal because it's a, it's a, 
it's a big community. Uh, they do really interesting, they have really interesting data problems. And I think Julian, you also mentioned these, um, you know, CERN is, is, is a big part of that, right? That's where actually most of the data comes from. Um, I just like to put faces uh, uh, on organizations. So these are uh, part of my current PhD students, as well as uh, research staff, uh, including Ivo Jimenez, who also used to be my student, but graduated last year and is now continuing to work with us, as well as uh, Jeff DeFever, who also used to be a student at uh, UC Santa Cruz, but then returned to, the, um, and he's actually the, fellow of the first incubator project uh, at Cross. So I want to start, um, uh, and I, you know, as I wrote in the abstract, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history of CEP. Um, uh, and it's it's a pretty amazing history. And I think it, it, it there's a lot of things that um, I learned from. Um, it is, a very successful, can be said as a very successful open source software project that came out of university. And actually the first part of the talk is really about sort of the implications of successful open source projects that come out of universities, right? Uh, and what that actually means for university. So in 2004, Sage did a summer internship at Lawrence Livermore. And uh, it was, you know, coming up with a scalable active active architecture for uh, for distributed metadata service for file systems. Um, and then in 2005, when I started working at UC Santa Cruz, I, one of my first tasks was to, to put together a summer project that would basically take all those uh, different pieces about object-based storage and create a journal paper. So at, this, at that time, 2005, there was sort of this opinion that Object storage was sort of a done deal for research. Um, you know, it was just sort of the complete this part of the research, just, you know, put a, you know, bow around it uh, in form of a journal paper, and then we're all done and then move on. And what actually happened uh, was SAF. And this was actually funded, this effort uh, was funded by the Department of um, Energy uh, in form of the National um, nuclear Security um, Administration, I think this is right, uh, say, and so the, the, which is headquarters in three uh, national labs, Los Alamos, Sandia National Labs, and Lawrence Livermore National Labs. And these, you know, there were basically three uh, uh, figures, dominant figures that, that really told us what kind of file system they wanted to have. And that basically went directly into the basic design of SEP. Right, so Ceph is very much rooted in its very basic design in the problems that HPC faced at that point, which was scalable file systems, um, and in particular, uh, checkpoint workloads. And so, um, so during that summer, Sage uh, discovered so many gaps in our research by simply implementing a total, you know, a complete system. So he was actually at the beginning of the summer, he actually got a file system to mount. Um, and so that, at that point, you know, we decided, okay, we have to give this file system a name because it actually is there. And so we decided on Seth. Um, and then, you know, eventually Sage uh, defended his PhD in record time. Uh, uh, and, uh, but then there was like some interesting, so, so just to, um, let me see whether I can get my cursor back here. Uh, so when you look at that uh, period, that looks like a successful PhD career, right? Um, but what then happens was unusual. So it turned out Sage Wild was already an entrepreneur. He had already founded two companies. One of them was Dreamhost, which exists today and is still successful. And he was essentially independently wealthy and also was motivated to work on an open source storage system that he could use in uh, web hosting, which is what DreamHost does. And uh, uh, storage is one of the biggest cost centers of web hosting and so, uh, or website hosting. And so that all made sense, right? And so um, he continued to work. And in fact, he 
became sort of part of DreamHost. That effort of working on Ceph became part of DreamHost, which was easy to do for him, but turned out to be actually a real problem for national labs uh, and other gov government agencies to actually fund this work because you just could not fund a web hosting company to do the future file system, right? It just didn't work. And so we had this meeting uh, somewhere around 2008 or 2009 where, uh, where we basically convinced Sage that you have to found a startup. There's like no other way. You have to be independent of a web hosting company so that government can actually throw money at you. And that's, that's really, I think that's how it stuck with me, right? A lot of the open source projects that you see today, um, they actually sometimes have simply structural problems because they don't make it easy for people to actually fund them. And so uh, this is slowly changing. Uh, I think the Linux foundations and other, the Software Freedom Conservancy, um, they are, these are all organizations that help open source people to, to actually create their structures that allow uh, funding. Um, but I think that was sort of a, a key insight for me, at least, that you have to have these structures. And it turns out also, it was a lot easier to hire uh, good people when you actually have a startup than if you're you know, part of a web hosting company, hire for file system development. But what then happened is that uh, maybe because of these initial structural uh, uh, difficulties, um, is that Sage discovered the OpenStack uh, uh, movement. And I, I don't know whether people, yeah, I mean, I'm sure people are familiar with OpenStack, but it was an incredibly fast growing movement uh, of creating an open source uh, stack, um, open source stack, basically a cloud stack. And so, um, and it turned out that they were very much in need of a very scalable open source storage system. And through just a fluke, somebody actually discovered that you could, by creating a block interface for Ceph, you suddenly Ceph fit on a, it fit perfectly into this virtualized environment, right? And so you could actually have a very fast block interface that was built on top of objects. And this was so much more of an opportunity. It was sort of like this, this uh, it just sucked all the energy uh, of, of Ceph development into this movement that essentially Ceph for years didn't even care about file systems, right? It was just that there was nothing there. So it was really just an object-based storage system to the point where Ceph today actually refers to an object-based storage system, not to a file system. And then only later when actually uh, uh, Ink Tank was founded, um, uh, that, that uh, Ceph of S was then coined as sort of a distinguished distinction to Ceph. Um, even though it was originally a file system, CephFS is now the file system among the many other roles that Ceph can play in, in, in sort of in a storage uh, ecosystem. And then 10 years after Sage wrote the first line of code, uh, Red Hat acquires Ink Tank for $175 million. So that, that was an amazing value. And so um, uh, today, uh, Ceph is like this, amazing thing it probably runs near you in a in a uh, local you know edge uh, storage center um, uh, uh, a lot of the mobile carriers uh, adopted Ceph and OpenStack to to do their metering um, in their various edge uh, deployments um, so the uh, there's a m many uh, companies involved in this uh, and you know, Ceph has sort of this very strategic role uh, for these companies. Um, and there's also a Ceph Foundation that's part of the Linux Foundation. Um, so it's a, it's a big deal today. Um, and when uh, uh, Sage, you know, sold Ink Tank to uh, Red Hat, that was sort of for us the signal to approach Sage and said, maybe it's time to give back to the university. And so, and he did, um, and he gave us basically two and a half million dollars 
plus $500,000 that were matched from the UC system um, to uh, create a presidential chair in open source software, which is currently, um, uh, as uh, I got carried by, by Scott Brand and uh, $2 million uh, uh, of a gift that was uh, to establish CROSS. And so CROSS came out as an idea where Sage said, I will give you money if you would create an, a structure in the university that would, um, that would enable other students to have a similar career as he did. Right. And for some reason, I had just uh, created this, this class with another student that would teach students how to engage in open source communities, and especially the Linux community. And that was sort of like the perfect lead in to uh, cross, right? This is basically, it was very clear. We needed something like that in the university and uh, we could build that out. And so that's what I did. Um, and today, Cross is uh, uh, sponsored by Kyosha, Fujitsu, Seagate, and Samsung, and in the past by SK Hynix, Micron, Western Digital, and Huawei. Um, and so uh, it's uh, it, the, the gift from Sage was the second bis biggest gift in the history of the School of Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and, uh, and Cross is today you know, elevated above the departments of UC Santa Cruz. And it's basically this poster child of something that shows that technology transfer can be something very different than what your typical technology transfer offices at, at universities um, do. Um, so going back to this history um, and, you know, and the thing that I studied pretty closely when I was trying to come up with Cross, um, is there is this thing uh, which is which I call the gap, right? Which is basically this problem that when PhD students graduate, they are super quality. They're like at the top of being able to do the job that they did for years as a PhD student. And the university at that very point shows them the door, right? You graduated, off you go. And, uh, and so I think that the, 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 this is often a welcome thing because, you know, students want to actually go into the job market or they have their plans maybe to be faculty or whatever, right? But often it turns out uh, they will never have the opportunity to go back to the things that they built and to actually build upon them. Um, and there is actually a subset of students, as it turns out, who would really like to continue uh, working on, uh, on the things that they build as part of their PhDs um, work. And so Sage is an example of that and, and all the incubator projects that we have currently at CROSS is that, right? And so basically CROSS is bridging this gap, um, which I call between student research and open source software. And there's basically these three components. You know, we teach students how to engage uh, in open source communities, we fund high impact research and we incubate developer communities um, around uh, PhD prototypes. And it's actually the last one that is really the key part of this effort. And it actually kind of drives all the other stuff as it turns out. Um, and so just like a quick overview of the governance, nothing unusual. It's very much modeled after a IUCRC, which is uh, by the National Science Foundation uh, is a, um, a model for industry university collaboration research uh, centers, a very well documented. Um, uh, there's a book that you can read, uh, that you can download, and it's, it's a fantastic compendium of organizational knowledge, how to make these things work and how to scale them. Um, and so we're very happy to have an advisory committee. Those are all, uh, these people all have appointments at UC Santa Cruz, um, including Doug Cutting, uh, who's uh, you know well known. Um, Karen Sandler, who's the executive director, director of Software Freedom Conservancy, Conservancy. Uh, Nisa Strutman, who is um, the VP of Technology, IP, Innovation, Strategic Partnerships at Visa. Many, many, many years, uh, uh, on, and still does work in the open source. Uh, 
part. So we have like Karen's, Karen and Nisa, both you know, our legal experts in open source software. Then of course, Sage, uh, and then James Davis, who is a professor here at UC Santa Cruz, who is interested in entrepreneurship in academia. Um, so why these companies um, that, you know, you wonder, um, these are big names, but they're not, uh, they're just specific companies when you actually look at them closely and they all make components. Um, and these are companies that tremendously benefited from SAP. Uh, it really changed the, their, their markets. Um, you have to understand that once, when you are a, let's say you're a storage device maker, you have to really in the past had to wait for permission for storage systems vendor to allow you to sell your product, right? So it had to be somebody like NetApp who had basically saying, oh yeah, we're gonna use Seagate drives in our products. And, uh, and then you saw the Seagate would sell through those um, channels, right? This of course completely changed um, with the cloud and then also with open source software. Um, and Ceph was one of the big players of that, that you could just sell into the market of people who run Ceph. Um, and uh, that's very different, right? Because now you can actually come up with a new product and you just have to engage with the Ceph community, let's say, to make sure that your product works well with that, uh, that open source software, right? So you just sort of remove this lock of, um, of, uh, of innovation in some sense uh, 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 by, by going open source. And so these people are very interested in any structure that will repeat this uh, experience. And that's why they are motivated to fund us. And they fund us for, uh, each for $100,000 a year, which was really sensational um, for the university leadership uh, to, um, to uh, experience, um, because this is way more than any kind of licensing through the IP department at the university for software, right? So the idea that open source software could generate a revenues like uh, almost half a million, sometimes we had actually six members, that's over half a million a year um, of gift funds is, is, is just unbelievable, right? That, that really started, like the UC system really started to perk up their, their ears and they also realize that they have no idea what this open source thing is. Um, and that's actually one of the, uh, also some of the problems that we're facing. Um, so quick uh, overview of the operational model. Um, so I'm actually horribly out of time, I realize. Um, so how much more time do I have? Just keep on going. Okay. Good. Um, so, uh, so a quick operational model, uh, we have basically two calls for proposals uh, per, per year. Um, and everybody, uh, and we actually add a third one now, and I will talk about it, which is called the uh, research uh, experience uh, program. So we want to actually open this up more and more so that not only UC Santa Cruz students can apply, but also any kind, any person who is interested in a postdoc position um, or uh, interested in, in becoming sort of a summer student. Um, and here's uh, some examples of the uh, incubator uh, fellows. Um, the requirements, the interesting thing here to read is really the requirements, right? You have to be a PhD uh, that uh, is well published um, so you have to ha earn your PhD. You start out with a significant code base from your PhD project. Um, and you have to show that the project that you're proposing is, uh, has, or is leveraging, uh, and, and, and is, and also, uh, is, was received with great interest by a well-established open source software community. So you've done your market research and so to speak, and you know, what other open source software communities are you, you're gonna leverage? That turned out to be critical important, as I said earlier about Ceph uh, with OpenStack. And that's something that we want to continue uh, enforcing because it turns out that 
that actually also lowers the likelihood that you um, that your project um, you know be, uh, it suffers this this death of the maintenance bottleneck death, right? That you just can't keep up with the popularity of your project, and you just can't grow your organization quick enough to to make um, to make your community happy and to make it grow. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to uh, quickly touch upon is uh, community seeding. So the goal of, uh, of the incubator is not to do research, but to grow the community around your prototype uh, and to actually turn it to an open source, successful open source project. And so, uh, and the best way to do that, as it turns out, and we didn't actually fully comprehend this at the beginning is to seed it with students. Um, there are a lot of people at the university who are, who are not busy with other jobs, who are busy learning things and have multiple points in their student career where they actually have to choose a project, where they have to, right? And, and that's always the struggle is like, how do you find a good project? And that's exactly what actually this, uh, the incubator fellows getting, are getting really good at is to come up with these project ideas and that will forward their incubator project, but also uh, they can provide the mentorship, right? And they're very interested in the outcome of these, uh, of these uh, project ideas. And it also helps them to actually grow their community infrastructure, right? How do you, and then the final thing is basically evaluation metric of that we review twice a year is how many contributors is each of these projects have from how many organizations, different organizations, right? And so it turns out a lot of the students who actually kind of get involved in these projects um, when they graduate, they kind of stick around. But then we also uh, leverage uh, things like Google Summer of Code, right? So we were, uh, already twice, uh, two years, we've been uh, a mentor organization, Google Summer of Code. And uh, then we actually have access to students all over the world, right? Um, so expected runtime is two to four years, which is matches actually what a postdoc does. And typically um, people are uh, paid sort of on a postdoc level, although there are some exceptions as well. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, so the research experience part is essentially a formal a framework for this idea of project ideas. And it's essentially creating a marketplace for project ideas. And what we want to do actually, and we're in the process of doing is uh, really creating a, yeah, sort of almost like a bidding place where funders can come in and say, I'm really interested in this particular organization um, that has this particular project portfolio. You know, this might be a research center, the university or a, a, a lab or something. And then they can say, I wanna, I wanna fund one or two students. Each student has sort of a price, let's say for summer, it's like, you know, less than $10,000. And they can, they can sort of bid on it, but they don't have, importantly, they don't have control over what the project actually, which project actually is gonna, gonna get funded. And because that's because you want to actually give that to the mentors. The mentors need to find the best student for their selection of projects and they have to decide which are the best matches, right? And so what we want to basically create is sort of this thing where you scale out by not cross or any of the central organizations can decide what matches should take place, but it's actually the mentor who drives who they want to work with. And then the funder basically, um, you know, funds these, these, these engagements. So this is sort of what we call the research experience. We're still building it. We're still uh, ironing out the kinks, but I'm very excited about this, that this uh, might actually work. Um, so I want to quickly skip through the research, we have like research projects, which are more traditional research projects that don't require uh, a software development. Um, we also have a symposium. All of these things are essentially 
there to drive innovation within the center and to feed both work into incubator projects. So two of these incubator projects are actually related to, sorry, two of these research projects are related to the incubator, to one of the incubator projects, um, as well as sort of, you know, raising awareness of all the good things that happen at UC Santa Cruz in terms of open source. The most important thing really is that CRUST becomes sort of this curator of all the open source activities that happen at the university. Um, and so just to, you know, maybe I should end here very soon because I don't want to run too much out of time, but um, what really works in CRUST in summary is that Ceph was really a catalyst uh, to have the industry engage in research prototypes via open source. Uh, because they saw that this can be quite powerful. Um, but it also um, uh, showed that the university should really curate and market open source portfolios uh, to attract talent and industry funding, right? Both for students as well as industry. Um, the incubator projects really worked as, um, uh, as a a way to engage top postdoc talent, you know, people who are between jobs, uh, people who, you know, want to really uh, focus on, on, on getting to change the world in some sense, um, but couldn't find a way to do this in, in the commercial sector. Um, the research experience is, is already uh, creating a lot of attention. A lot of students want to be part of it. Um, the, the cool thing is that all of our incubator projects have technologies that just by being involved in these technologies is really helping undergraduates to, to get a much better resume um, because they've been you know, involved in developing Ceph or have to deal with containers or so forth. Um, uh, there's also this thing called industry practitioner in residence, which is basically this idea that we'd hire uh, industry veterans when they are between jobs uh, for like maybe a year and then they become sort of part of the part of cross and can sort of share their experience with students and faculty which was also in the past already shown extremely valuable and then we have like these call for proposals which are um, you know that we have the stream of uh, calls every twice a year has been sort of really helping establishing this idea of cross in, in the university. Um, so uh, the interesting thing also is that one of the outcomes of the past industry practitioners that we hired was that that uh, practitioner discovered that actually cross could also be a, a incubator for standardization, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, uh, it, but it turns out that a lot of industries have very little extra money to run their own research labs. And they really depend on um, research at universities. But if you actually get a consortium where actually the majority of all industry players are in that consortium, that creates a protected place to discuss future standards um, and kind of do the research that's necessary to really organize that standard. And that's a very powerful thing. It's both good for the students uh, as well as good for the companies. It's sort of a new role that universities could play here. Um, so again, you know, Ceph as a catalyst, uh, as adoption of Ceph or any other successful open source software goes up, um, the value of Ceph-based research increases. Right, so an example, for instance, the CMU's recent SOSB 19 paper on Ceph's true store, which was not the best paper uh, according to the conference, was not selected as the best paper, but was by far the most downloaded paper uh, from, from the USENIX site. Um, so you can see that like an open source software like Ceph is really drawing much more attention to uh, even academic work, like uh, things that are published at SOSB. Um, uh, the job, job market value of students who get involved in Ceph increases, uh, and then also funding opportunities multiply, right? So, 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 so open source software can really be, um, uh, be sort of a, a, 
a trigger for a lot of things when it becomes successful. And um, let's see, I, uh, uh, so I just wanted to, you know, maybe end here. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't get to this technical part, but um, there are many examples of very successful uh, uh, open source uh, efforts, Linux, Drupal, Spark, LLVM, Ray, Ceph, Berkeley DB, you know, all of these came out of universities. Uh, it's actually interesting because uh, a lot of them are actually counted as personal projects. But when you look closely, these people were at universities and they were inspired by their, you know, their, their work or their, their, what they learned at universities to do these projects, right? And because of that, universities never get any credit <laughs> that, that they actually started these things, right? Because universities have no way of actually even managing this today, right? So the actual impact on society that is actually clearly there because of uh, these projects um, is not counted. And this is like translation is the word, you know, for universities. It's like a super, super valuable thing for uh, research universities to show that they have translation. How much translation do they have, right? Uh, how much impact on society do they have? Um, it's just com totally ignored. And then the opportunities uh, for mentorship, funding, industry relations, mostly ignored, right? Um, all, almost all research groups that I am aware are using open source software for teaching and, and, um, and prototyping. Uh, but there's no general framework at universities in general that, that, that actually manages that, right? Um, software is still not considered to be an academic contribution, although that is slowly changing. Um, uh, technology transfer offices have no idea what the value of open source software is or what open source licensing even is supposed to do and what, you know, what the different strategic strategies are around these different licenses. Um, so I think it is really time to create an open source program office for universities. Um, this is something that uh, actually was started by Moss Labs recently. Uh, Jacob Green um, is sort of uh, leading an effort uh, together with CMU, sorry, J uh, John, John Hopkins University um, to, um, to create sort of a uh, OSPO, you know, OSPOs at 10 universities. Right. And if you're interested in this effort, please contact me. I can hook you up. Uh, but I'm very excited about this. Uh, uh, the open source program offices has been tremendously successful in the industry. There's uh, the to do group uh, that is sort of the umbrella organization of open source program offices. And, uh, uh, and that has really uh, changed the attitude towards open source in industry uh, and how it's managed. Um, but clearly, you know, universities has a different set of tasks to deal with than, than industry. Um, so, yeah, this is pretty much the end of it. Um, uh, so any questions, comments, uh, feedback?